In this video, I'm going to share five secrets that falls into the realm of landscape photography. So these secrets are something I don't really hear many other landscape photographers talk about, but it is absolutely crucial to know of them if you want to improve as a landscape photographer. So obviously these secrets are not really secrets. It's more like experiences and observations I have done myself as a landscape photographer. If they were secret, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't share them with you. So these secrets are inspired by a bunch of questions I got asked the other day when I put a Q&A up on Instagram. So thank you so much for all the questions. And without further ado, here's the first secret. <laughs> so the first thing I want to talk about is how to deal with expectations from fans and customers versus growing as an artist. That one is an age-old question and super interesting. So first and foremost, I have been very lucky that my style of photography, what I found interesting with landscape photography and in the direction I went with my landscape photography has worked out really, really well on Instagram. It fits well with the Instagram format and arguably also with the YouTube format, social media format in general, because it is very wow. You get a wow, you get a kick out of it when you see those photos, like boom, straight in your face. Now I am changing a little bit and I've become very fond of woodland photography and especially woodland photography in Denmark. And let's just be honest, Denmark is neither Iceland nor the Faroe Islands and it is not epic and it is not wow when you see it, but it can be. That being said, when I do make photography in Denmark and my woodland photography, I am not aiming for that wow. I want to make something which is a little bit more everlasting, you know, something you want to put on your wall that doesn't take up all the attention of the room, something that is just like a bit more fine artsy without being in your face. And that can be a very hard change because that doesn't work well with Instagram at all. So I'm caught in this limbo between doing what I've always done and not really changing and be successful on the social medias or just to follow my passion and my heart and start doing something else. And for me, the answer is simple. Follow my passion. Be authentic to what's going on inside my brain. Don't think too much about it because people can see through bullshit. And if you are not making photos that please yourself, especially when you like me have a YouTube channel and you're talking to a camera. It is, you, you can't really fake enthusiasm. So at some point you just have to accept that, okay, I'm just doing something else. Be authentic. And in my honest opinion, and I think also in my experience, people prefer that way, way more than a person who just goes out and do whatever is popular and trendy. It is also important to say that just because I really enjoy woodland photography in Denmark doesn't mean I don't enjoy photographing epic vistas. You can do both and instead of using the word changing, I'd rather say I'm broadening my landscape photography. And so can you. Just stay authentic to who you are and what you want. So the next secret I want to talk about is how do you improve your photography without necessarily going out and practicing? Well, that is very simple. You study it. Uh, as a teacher, I know there is this relationship between theory and the practical matters. So you study a lot of theory uh, in case you want to know about photography settings. Obviously, you read about those settings. You listen to what other photographers say. Uh, you listen to a teacher, Yeah, read a book. You see tutorials about it and then you go out and practice it. There is this relationship between theory and practice. That, that's just how you learn. It's, uh, it's very basic. 
So if you absolutely do not want to go out and practice, I can highly recommend that you find a photography group on Facebook or you find, go to 500 pixels or a photography forum, a place with a lot of different photographs. And it doesn't matter if it's portraits or landscapes or street photography or, or whatever. Just take all the photos that springs out to your eyes, something that you like to look at and save those photos into a folder. When you have between 20 and 50 photos, just go through them, analyze them. Why do you prefer these photos? What is it in these photos that you like? And you might see a pattern in what your unconscious brain chose to look at. And you might find like five similarities between these 20 to 50 photos that you really, really like. And already there, I would argue you have improved your photography because you are more self-aware about what you want to go and photograph when you go outside the door next time. And of course, if you want to study some composition and my YouTube videos on that subject isn't enough, be sure to check out my ebook on composition and landscape photography. There are both a free light version you can get by signing up for my newsletter and of course the full 100 plus pages version. So the next secret I want to share with you is where are my best spots for photography in Denmark? Let me rephrase that question. Where are the best spots for photography? And to answer that question, the answer is Antelope Canyon, Arizona, just outside of the town of Page. That is where Peter Lake got his photo called Phantom, which have sold for a staggering $6.5 million as a print. Now, there were some dodgy things going on with that, but nevertheless, the next best photo is a photo down in Holland, I think, or Germany, just next to the River Rhine. And here a guy with the nice name Gorski, that's his surname, got the second most expensive photo ever taken. Although there was something about that he cloned out some big factory or something like that, but it doesn't matter. These two places must necessarily be the best places for photography ever because you earn a lot from those prints. My personal best spots for photography, and those are actually in Denmark, is in Sigebo, Norskov, North Forest, and in a place called Lango Esko. And I visit them in my Tales from the Forest 2 and 3. And here I got two of my favorite photos this year. Actually, those photos are so good that I have paid about $900 to get two huge prints that I have hung on my wall back home in my apartment. Another really great spot for photography is in the Faroe Islands on the island of Kalsoy. Not the traditional photo of the big mountain there, but along the northern coastline. Here I really just got a shot with some great light that was shared by an Instagram account with more than 1 million followers. Uh, that has also happened with one of my photos from Hauifoss in Iceland. This one was shared by another account with more than 2 million followers. And in that way, a lot of other feature accounts or photography hubs on Instagram have shared that photo. So I got a bunch new followers and really got my reach out. Now I hope you can see the point of why I'm answering in this super vague way. And that is basically, what is the purpose? What makes a photography location the best? What is it you want to do with your photographs? There are no best place for photography unless you define what your goal with your photography is. Do you want to earn millions? Do you want to get photos that you actually want to hang on your wall? 
Do you want to make photos that are popular on the social medias like Instagram so you can get a lot of followers and a lot of dopamine kicks out of a lot of likes? I can't tell you that. Personally, I of course want to earn money from my photos. That doesn't mean that I should go to Iceland because Iceland has a lot of photographers up there. So. It is very saturated with what I can earn money from. Maybe I should just focus on being the best landscape photographer in Denmark, whatever that means, and just sell prints to Danes. And doesn't that make more sense? If I want to sell photos in Denmark to Danes, maybe what I'm taking a photo of should be something in Denmark. I invite you to check out the short video about Andreas Skorsky, whom I mentioned in this secret via the link in the upper right corner. There are a very clear purpose to Gorsky's photos. So the next secret ooh, I want to share is how to actually get traction on Instagram. And the simple answer is put up stuff on Instagram that other people want to look at. It's that simple. Nobody cares about you as an individual photographer, because there are plenty of us, before you have proved that you are worth spending their time on. A lot of photographers would say that you should shoot for yourself. And yes, of course you should shoot for yourself. But if you want to get traction on Instagram, you need to also fall in line with what people want to look at on Instagram. And Instagram might not be the right medium for you to become popular. Remember that this is very important because Instagram is looked on on phones. That's a very, very small screen, which means that the photo that you are producing have to scream out in the face of the viewer that scrolls by. You want to get those likes, you want to get those comments, uh, you want to get that organic reach on Instagram. And you only do that by making photos that grabs attention. Now I'm not saying that you absolutely have to shoot at flaming red sunsets at the most epic locations in the entire world. But the sad fact is that that does help if you want to get traction on Instagram. Another way to do it is just fall in line and do as all the Instagram travel photographers do. Blown out highlights, desaturated colors, and a yellow rain jacket in the middle of the photo. Arguably, that's not very creative and it might not even be your style. But if you want to get traction on Instagram, and that's your purpose in life, well, that is a way to go. There are of course also all the regular basic tips such that you have a feed that has the same theme. Me as a landscape photographer, it would just make so little sense that I upload a portrait photo every third or fourth photo or some street photography. And since my photos are often colorful and epic, it just goes to show that whenever I upload a more calm tree photo from Denmark, that photo just does not get the same traction on Instagram. It's just it's almost like rules of human psychology. The next tip is of course to use the right hashtags and make sure that those hashtags cover your photo, whatever it is, and that you also maybe get some features from some of those uh, photo photography hops that you see on Instagram. And the last tip is of course, it's social media. So be social, interact with people around you, create a community around your photos and be part of a community with other photographers. Nobody likes a person who just throws up a photo and never engage with their, their followers or potential followers because there are again plenty of photographers out there who actually do so we have to think about that too be social 
You might ask how in the world so many tips about Instagram improves me as a landscape photographer. This relates back to the first and third point I share in this video. Of course it doesn't improve your composition or your ability to manage your camera, but a landscape photographer needs to know way more than just that. These secrets or tips relate to the business side of landscape photography and even more so to you as a person. I want to push a self-awareness in you about what the purpose of your photography is. I do not mean what the purpose of your individual photo is. Where are you going and what do you really want to do? This can be as simple as, I just want to put beautiful photos on my wall. But it can also be, I want to be the next Gorski. If it is the latter, it doesn't matter whatsoever how well you perform on Instagram. You need to spend your time differently. This in turn will affect how and what you photograph and improve you as a landscape photographer. So the fifth and final secret I want to share with you is that yes, gear matters, but as a beginner photographer, probably not in the way you think it matters. Yes, I am using a Sony a7R 3 It has 42.2 megapixels. That makes a big and sharp photo. But is it the big and sharpness of the photo that makes it a good photo? Nope, obviously not. I have photos that are 6 megapixels and are way, way, way more popular on, let's say, Instagram than some of my best photos at 42 megapixels are. Yes, my camera is also really good at filming in the dark and photographing in the dark. I can crank up the ISO quite a lot more than I can do on a small, let's say, A6000. And that means that I can get fairly clean photos of the Milky Way and of the Northern Lights. Especially when you photograph the Northern Lights, it's super important that you have a camera that can photograph at a high ISO, like let's say 3200 or 6400, and deliver fairly clean results. Think about your camera as a tool that are supposed to deliver a certain product. If you look at Thomas Heaton about a year ago, he started to look into getting a new camera. And it was just so obvious that he didn't really care about getting that new camera. He tried a 50 megapixel camera, he tried a medium format camera, and yeah, as he said himself, that he thought that his video quality went down. So he just gave up on all of that. And he's still using his 5D Mark IV, which is a 30 megapixel camera and delivers really good results. Thomas Heaton doesn't photograph during night. He is a landscape photographer who usually go out and photograph either in the golden hour or on moody days. So yes, of course gear matters, but gear is good for delivering a, a good quality image in regard to sharpness and making it noise free. But that's about it. You as a photographer has to do the rest. Many of my best photos are still photos that I have shot on a 5D Mark II or a 5D Mark III. And those are only 20 megapixels. Sometimes I do get a really, really good photo on my Sony A6000. So yes, let me sum up by saying, yes, gear matters, but only on negligible parameters. You don't need the newest and best camera to go out and make award-winning photos. A big thanks to you, Thomas, for letting me borrow a couple of scenes from your videos. I thoroughly enjoy following along on your photography journey. Also, a big thanks to the rest of you for watching. I hope I, with this video, has sparked a few thoughts that'll get you to reflect upon what it is you want to achieve with your photography. Be yourself, keep learning, keep experimenting. What is your audience? What do you really want to do? What is your mission and how do you fulfill it? These are the real questions photographers should ask themselves, not what shutter speed or lens each other use. 
And of course, if you just want to learn about composition, be sure to check out my ebook down in the description. Be sure to get the free version first as to have a better idea about what you will be buying. I personally prefer to have an idea about that. So again, thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.